Dr. Adele Brennock. Dr. Adele Brennock earned her Bachelor of Arts degree in Celtic Studies from the University College Dublin in 1979, and in 1983, she was the RIS Scholar student in Celtic Studies at Oxford. In 1991, Dr. Brannock received her PhD from the National University of Ireland. Donor, Dr. Brannock has served as Secretary to the Department of Foreign Affairs for Ireland from 1979 to 1988. In 2006, Dr. Brannock was the National Coordinator of the 400th Anniversary Celebrations of the foundation of the Irish Franciscan College in Louvain, Belgium. Presently, Dr. Brennock is Deputy Director of the Michal O'Cleary Institute for the Study of Irish History and Civilization at University College Dublin. There she manages the Michal O'Cleary Seminars and the Institute's projects. Dr. Brannock is a medieval historian who has worked on many topics in early and, me and medieval late history, including the Tara Project in County Meath, the intellectual history of medieval Ireland, landscape surveys, and the Fra Franciscan friars in the vernacular tradition. She guided the University College Dublin Michal O'Cleary Institute's project on the material culture of the mendicant orders in Ireland. She currently directs three other Michal O'Cleary Institute projects on the early books and manuscripts heritage of the Irish Franciscans. She is a member of the Place Names Commission and is a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London. Donner, Dr. Brannock is the author of numerous publications including The Kingship and Landscape of Tara, and co-editor with Dr. Cunningham of Writing Irish History, The Four Masters and Their World, a catalogue of an exhibition held in Trinity College Library. She is also co-editor with Dr. John McCafferty, the UCD Michal O'Cleary Institute, and Dr. Joseph McMahon, OFM, of the Irish Franciscans. Today, Dr. Brennock weaves a path through history that connects two powerful, holy women, St. Bridget of Ireland and St. Clare of Assisi, women whose lives hold a profound message of female sanctity for the contemporary world. It is my privilege to introduce Dr. Adele Brennock. First of all, I wish uh, Your Excellency President Miranda, uh, all of you uh, here, really to thank you so much for inviting me to give this uh, year's Charter Day lecture. It is really an honour and I have spent uh, four days, four wonderful days here with the community of sisters. It has been like home from home really, so many of, of you like me are from Ireland. And I really have to thank most sincerely Sister Marguerite and Sister Eileen Valerie. Um, to us at home, they may not know this, but I'm telling you now, they are known by the Irish friars and myself as super nuns. <laughs> so, greetings from the Friars Minor uh, of the Irish province, whose magnificent archive has really become part of my life. And now I come to St. Clair. One of the earliest references, if not the earliest, in medieval Irish records to St. Clare appears in a papal indulgence granted by Pope Nicholas IV in 1291 to two friaries in the southern part of Ireland, in the city of Limerick and the borough of Nina, County Tipperary. And here I have the text on the screen. So on the 28th of March, 1291, the Pope uh, granted a relaxation of 140 days of enjoined penance granted by the Pope to penitents visiting the church of the Friars Minor of Limerick on the feasts of the Blessed Virgin, St. Francis, St. Anthony and St. Clare and in their octaves. On the 15th of May in the same year, the Pope granted a similar indulgence to penitents visiting the church of the Friars Minor of Nina in the Diocese of Killaloo, which is around the Shannon estuary, uh, on the feasts of St. Francis, 
St. Anthony, St. Brandon, St. Clare and St. Bridget in their octaves and on the anniversary of the dedication of the church. These indulgences were part of Pope Nicholas's institution of a formal rule of, for Franciscan penitence encapsulated in a bull, Supramontem, issued in 1289. The references relate to the first phase of Franciscan foundations in Ireland, which began in the 1220s and which initiated a new connection between Ireland and Europe, one which introduced new orders, including the Franciscans and Dominicans to the country, and with them new saints, including Francis, Clare, Anthony and Dominic. But as ever in Ireland, new trends were adapted to existing practices and devotions, were always slightly different. This tendency is clearly expressed in these papal indulgences of 1291. For listed among the international feast days, the Blessed Virgin, Francis, Anthony and Clare, are two native saints, Saint Brendan and Saint Bridget. And it is the comparison between Clare and Bridget and its impact on the devotion to Clare in Ireland that forms the core of my lecture today. The manifestation of medieval female sanctity in two different cultures and in two different chronological eras. So I start with the idea of imitatio Christi and imitatio Mariae, or the creation of a female saint. To begin my discussion, I will digress for a minute from St. Clair to St. Bridget to explain who she is and what we know about her. Well, firstly, she's a very controversial saint, as scholars have argued for decades if she was a historical person at all. She's identified as the patron saint of the Royal Monastery of Kildare in the Irish Midlands, which grew from the 6th century AD onwards to become one of the most powerful churches in Ireland prior to the 12th century. Kildare was a royal church, a centre of learning and a wealthy foundation with many estates in the East and Midlands of Ireland. It was what we call a double monastery, namely it had a male and a female monastic structure headed by a bishop and, a, and an abbess, which was similar somewhat to the continental models uh, founded in Gaul by people such as uh, Caesarius of Arles in the 5th century. A very polished life of Bridget was written in Latin by a scholar in her monastery as early as the 680s AD. He called himself Cogitosus, the one who knows. And indeed he was well versed in Latin and in a deeply Christian ethos. And there we have a uh, 15th century representation of St. Bridget from Cologne in Germany. Um, not always the one that you would see at home. Anyway, the ethos of Cogitosis and his life is best expressed by uh, Sean Connolly and Jean-Michel Picard, the two scholars who translated his life into English in 1987. And here I have a quotation from Connolly and Picard. Running through the life of Bridget is a thread which gives it cohesion and depth. It is made up of two strands, the two theological virtues of faith and charity, interwoven with lesser but very important monastic virtues of chastity and obedience. The Logion of Jesus in Mark 9.22, all things are possible to him who believes, keeps recurring throughout the life. Now, Cogitosis' mission in this life was to write a thoroughly Christian life of his monastery's patron, as Bridget was also a very important goddess in the pre-Christian Irish pantheon, the goddess of craftsmen and poets. The Christian saint's feast day falls on the 1st of February, the beginning of spring, and a vital time in the agricultural seasons especially in what was a thoroughly rural and pastoral uh, society. And this has been seen as an indication that the goddess was transmogrified into a Christian saint. This may have been so, 
and we have immense universal evidence of such shifts in local cults. But there are two key considerations regarding the Christian Saint Bridget. It is likely that some woman who may have taken the name Bridget converted a pre-Christian cultic centre at Kildare in the Irish Midlands to Christianity, and that this then became the Royal Church. And also that she was regarded as the head of women who choose to dedicate themselves to a veiled holy life in the early stages of the conversion process in Ireland, so in the period 400 to 700 AD. She is described as the holy head of the veiled women of Ireland in a calendar of saints composed in Ireland around 800 AD. She is also not alone, uh, viewed not alone as the embodiment of imitatio Mariae, that she is in the image of Mary, but even of being another Mary. An early poem includes the verse, and I quote, a fair birth, a fair dignity will come, who shall be called from her great virtues, truly pious Bridget. She will be another Mary, mother of the great Lord. And if we compare hymns to Bridget and to the Virgin from the early medieval Irish tradition, we find that the language used of both is remarkably similar. So on one side we have here a poem or part of a poem written by a man called Cú Chivne, and his name alone has wonderful resonances in that it means the hound of memory, he who remembers. And he belonged to the great monastery uh, off, of, off the western coast of Scotland of Iona. And Cúchivna wrote of the Virgin Mary in the early 8th century. Let us put on the arms of light, breastplate and helmet, that we may be perfect for God, received through Mary. We beseech the most worthy merit of Saint Mary, that we may be worthy to inhabit the loftiest throne. Amen. Slightly earlier, a bishop uh, of a place called Ardbracken, which again is in the Midlands of Ireland, wrote about Bridget. May she, destroy us with the, may she destroy within us the taxes of our flesh, the branch with blossoms, the mother of Jesus, the dear true virgin of immense honour, I shall always be safe with my saint from Leinster. And Leinster is the eastern province of Ireland. So she is uh, his protector. Now, given the likely non-Christian associations of Bridget, it was necessary to ground her in a thoroughly Christian culture. And perhaps this explains why she was identified so closely with Mary. And this brings us to something that we should reflect on about female sanctity. No matter how shadowy in a historical context, Bridget had to be based on imitatio Mariae, in the image of Mary. And now if I turn to Saint Clare, um, and to the same ideas of the Marian element uh, in the life and texts. What of the Marian element in the life and texts associated with this much later and well-attested historical saint? In imagery, depictions of Clare have an evident Marian aspect, where Francis is the other Christ, Clare is the other Mary, perhaps not as explicitly as Bridget is, and she is also regarded as a virgin martyr. William Cook, in his essay on early images of Clare, cites, for example, the early 14th century images in the vault over the high altar of Santa Chiara in Assisi. Clare is there with the Virgin, her sister Agnes, and five virgin martyrs of the early church. As Francis is linked to Christ, Clare is the reflection of the Virgin Mary. Furthermore, in the testimony of Sister Benvenuta relating Clare's death, she narrates her vision of Mary, who appears as a feudal queen surrounded by her ladies. And this is interpreted by Benvenuta as Mary coming to clothe Clare in her heavenly garb. The complete opposite to the poverty of her garments during her lifetime. In the, work, in the words of Marco Bartoli in his study of St. Clare, she who had always wanted to be clothed in most poor garments was now at the point of death to be reclothed 
in garments which were the richest, the softest, the most precious. Indeed, she was to be clothed in the garments of the Queen of Heaven herself, who came in person to bring them to her. And hence the idea of material poverty on earth leading to the riches of heaven. The most striking expressions occur in Claire's third letter to Agnes of Bohemia, in which she explains her concept of spiritual motherhood and spiritual maternity to Agnes in the following terms. As the glorious virgin of virgins carried him, Christ, physically in the little cloister of her womb, so you, Agnes, can always carry him spiritually in, her own, in your own chastely virginal body by following his way, especially following his humble and poor steps. Thus there was a fruitfulness rather than a barrenness to spiritual life, and a woman could have an intense maternal experience believing that she was metaphorically carrying Christ within her. And just as a small aside, we find, for example, another female saint in Ireland, Saint Eta, who is described as the foster mother of Christ and depicted as such. And interestingly, uh, the matrona or the female motherly figure of her own tribe in the south of Ireland. So that is the Marian element as part of creating uh, female sanctity. Now to what I would call the real word, world, in other words, sharing authority with significant men. Ireland's apostle is St. Patrick, who converted parts of the island to Christianity sometime in the fifth century. And fortunately for us, the testimony of his mission, written by himself in Latin, survives. While Patrick provides a detailed account of his approach to conversion, including the conversion of women and the beginnings of community life among women in Ireland, and also the dangers encountered by him and others in their task, he frustratingly includes very little factual detail. Where and when he worked and who he met. So that date of 432, that may be ingrained in your minds from your school days, those of you who are schooled in Ireland, forget it. He didn't tell us he came in 431. Later lives, composed from the 7th century onwards, attempt to complete the picture, but do so to advance particular ecclesiastical and secular political ambitions, such as the cause for the primacy of the Church of Armagh over all other churches in Ireland. This agenda brings Armagh and Patrick's biographers into conflict with the ambitions of Bridget's church at Kildare, and the relationship between both saints, Patrick and Bridget, is normally read in this context of this power struggle between the two churches. However, there are layers of meanings in this relationship between Patrick and Bridget, just there as there are in the relationship between Claire and Francis, but they are expressed in a very different way. There is less of a personal and real historical dialogue between Patrick and Bridget. Unlike Francis and Claire, theirs is an invented relationship to articulate the balance of authority uh, between the head of two important institutions, <clears throat> and also between a man and a woman in authority. I'll give you three examples of the relationship between Patrick and Bridget from the 7th and 8th century lives of Bridget. The sharing of authority in the early Irish church between Bat Patrick and Bridget's churches of Armagh and Kildare is conveyed in the following terms in the 7th century. And from then on, the anointed head and primate of all the bishops and the most blessed chief abbess of the virgins governed their primatial church by means of a mutually happy alliance and by the rudder of all the virtues. By the merits of both, their episcopal and conventual see spread on all sides like a fruitful vine with all its branches and struck root in the whole island of Ireland. It has always been ruled over in happy succession according to a perpetual right by the Archbishop of the Bishops of Ireland, in other words, Patrick and his successors at Armagh, and the abbess, whom the abbesses of all the Irish revere, in other words, Bridget and the Abbess of Kildare after her. Here we see two institutions in the Irish church, the Episcopal male and the Abbatial female, agreeing to coexist, 
although ultimately Patrick's successor holds the highest ecclesiastical office in Ireland. In the first episode of the 8th century life, we find Bridget involved in an exegetical and apocryphal dialogue with Patrick, in which she narrates a dream that she has had while Patrick was preaching, and she unwittingly slept through his sermon. Patrick interprets her dream, and as you will hear, this text is replete with the imagery of the book of Revelation, and indeed these apocalyptic uh, texts, such as that of Joachim of Fiore, that had such an effect in the 13th century. Bridget said, I, your handmaid, saw four ploughs ploughing this island, and sowers sowed seed, and it grew immediately, and began to ripen, and streams of new milk filled the furrows, and the sowers were clothed in white garments. Next I saw other ploughs and black ploughmen who uprooted the good crop and tore it with the ploughshare and sowed cockle and rivers of water filled the furrows. And Patrick said, Maiden, the vision you have seen is a true and wonderful one. We are the good ploughmen who cleave human hearts with ploughs and sow the word of God and milk of elementary teaching. But at the end of the world, teachers in collusion with wicked people will come and will undermine our teaching everywhere and lead almost everyone astray. In this instant, instance, Bridget is the emissary and Patrick the interpreter. Elsewhere, she reverts to playing the more obviously female role of making Patrick's shroud of linen with her own hands at the, his request, as he desired to rise to eternal life with that shroud. Finally, Bridget, in according with well-established tradition, wrought a miracle of plenty when Patrick visited a smaller church inhabited by a few of Bridget's community. A large crowd gathered and the nuns were alarmed as they had not sufficient food for everyone. But Bridget reassured them saying, there will be enough for the whole lot of us, for the sacred scriptures will be read to us, thanks to which we shall forget about bodily food. Everyone ate, and food was left over. Thus, as with so many of Bridget's miracles, her faith enabled her to provide. Thomas of Celano's Life of Clare includes a number of such miracles, stock miracles, I suppose, of plenty, as in the multiplication of bread when the supplies in San Damiano had virtually run out, and another similar miracle involved, involving the replacement of oil in a vessel. But Claire's connection to Francis is altogether different from Bridget to Patrick. The primary difference, of course, is that it is a historically attested connection in which the witnesses themselves converse through their own testimonies, even if sometimes at second hand, and the witnesses of others close to them. As Claire survived 27 years beyond Francis, she acted virtually as an altar Franciscus, at least to her own community. In the Testament of St. Clair, a document now regarded as a compilation of memories preserved in San Damiano, possibly refined by Leo, uh, Francis's brother companion, the centrality of Francis to Clare's way of life and that of the poor ladies is clearly set forth. While he was living, he was not content to encourage us with many words and examples to the love of holy poverty and its observance, but he gave us many writings, plura scripta, that after his death, we would in no way turn away from it, as the Son of God never wishes to turn away from this holy poverty while he lived in this world. And the influence of the plura scripta, the many writings given by Francis de Clare to contemplate, is beautifully expressed in the image of the mirror most expansively described in her fourth letter to Agnes of Bohemia a mirror which reflects the life of a sister in the birth, life, and passion of Christ. Insofar as this vision of him is the splendor of eternal glory, the brightness of everlasting light and an unspotted mirror, look into this mirror every day, O Queen, beloved of Jesus Christ. There, continually ponder on your own face so that you may adorn your whole being within and without in robes of wonderful variety. Adorn your whole being with virtues like flowers and with garments every bit as ornate as those of the daughter and beloved bride 
of the Most High King that is only fitting. This is only fitting. It is in this mirror that blessed poverty shines, that holy humility and charity that cannot be adequately described shines, and so forth. And so she exhorts Agnes to contemplate poverty as she gazes at the edge of the mirror, humility as her gaze moves towards the centre, and charity as her gaze fixes in the centre of the mirror. For Bridget, as she is portrayed in the earliest extant version of her life, charity and fraternal love rooted in the doctrine of the mystical body of Christ is at the core of her mission. She constantly sees Christ in the poor, and it is noteworthy that she is represented very differently to Patrick in this aspect of the early lives. Patrick is portrayed as the apostle of the Irish, whose mission is to convert kings and found churches. Bridget advises kings on good behaviour, a topos that uses the earliest genre of mirror imagery, the speculum principum, the mirror of princes, that early form of political and social theory that advances stability in society, which has echoes in Clare's mirror, although Clare's mirror or speculum is far more mystical than the worldly speculum. Bridget is particularly welcoming to guests, for every guest is Christ, a fundamental ideal in monasticism. When she gives away her bishop, bishop's vestments to the poor, she is regarded as following the example of the blessed Job, in that she never allowed the poor to go away empty-handed, and she replaced the vestments with new vestments given to her by Christ, whom she used to clothe in the person of the beggar. Now I move to the devotion to Bridget and Clare in Ireland. As, I, as you've gathered, the two saints are quite different in their approach to the world. Clare, very much in a cloistered life, perhaps for practical um, circumstances of her life, while Bridget is always depicted on the roads, constantly travelling, encountering the normal uh, routine activities of life, the harvest, road building, battles and violence. So we have to have that in mind when we look at uh, both of them in an Irish context. One element of the death of Clare has a striking parallel in the life of Bridget. On her deathbed, Clare has to console her sister Agnes, who is overwhelmed by tears and beseeching her sister not to leave her. But Clare replies, it is pleasing to God, dearest sister, that I go hence. But as for you, cease weeping, for you will come to the Lord soon after myself. And before I depart from you, the Lord will grant you a great consolation. And this came to pass as Agnes died soon after her sister. In Bridget's case, her close confidant uh, and the next abbess of her monastery, and even perhaps the genuine historical founder of the church at Kildare, a woman called Dar Luchduch, wanted to leave this life with her as well. But Bridget replied, you will survive me by one year, and on the day of my death, you will die that we may have the one feast day. And so it happened. Both Clare and Bridget's tombs attracted pilgrims, although miracles linked to Bridget after her death are not common. Her miracles were wrought during her life. There is a spectacular description of her tomb in the seventh century life. And for a long time, scholars have argued as to its authenticity. And of course, this is all linked to the historicity of Bridget. Nevertheless, I think it's worth quoting for its splendid sort of Byzantine description of what may have been in a monastery in 7th century Ireland. Neither should one pass over in silence the miracle wrought in the repairing of the church, this is Kildare, in which the glorious bodies of both, Archbishop Conlaith, who was the first Archbishop of Kildare, and our most flourishing virgin, Bridget, are laid on the right and the left of the ornate altar, and rest in tombs adorned with a refined profusion of gold, silver, gems, and precious stones, with gold and silver chandeliers hanging from above and different images providing a variety of carvings and colors. That may be slightly exaggerated and based on what somebody has seen in Europe and not what actually was in Kildare. But of course, Bridget's tomb, if it did exist at all, did not survive and therefore did not become a site of pilgrimage 
although the Monastery of Kildare continued to be one of the most important churches in Ireland until the 12th century, when Episcopal authority in the region was transferred to Dublin. This contrasts with Clare, whose body was carefully guarded and whose obsequies were dramatic as they were celebrated by no less a person than Pope Innocent, who had attended her on her deathbed, possibly ensuring that her cult was in somewhat uh, put into an official frame, if I can put it like that. And as Thomas of Chilano reports in his Life of Clare, miracles were attributed to, attributed to her after her death and a process of canonization which led to her being inscribed in the calendar of saints in 1255 took place. Being outside the sphere of official canonization, the devotion to Bridget took a very different but very deep root in Ireland, as testified to by the dozens of holy wells and small medieval churches dedicated to her throughout the country to this day, and also the persistence to the present day of naming girls after her. So for example, my own sister, uh, is called Breed, and my daughter's second name is Breed. So it would be a common name uh, for women in Ireland. Now, the Franciscans arrived in Ireland sometime in the 1220s and spread rapidly through the towns and rural boroughs. Their influence on the Irish church and Irish society in the Middle Ages was immense, and the ruins of their monumental medieval friaries dominate many towns and rural landscapes to this day. And I'll just show you one particularly fine example, uh, which is in the west of Ireland, uh, the Friary of Kilconnell in County Galway. Uh, most of the Friary was built in and around uh, 1450 AD. Sculpted images of St. Francis are fairly common features of these medieval buildings, often very deliberately placed between the chancel and the nave. In other words, between the community and friars and the lay people. One of the finest examples uh, of this type of imagery uh, is also from a 15th century friary of Ennis, also in the west of Ireland, in County Clare. Here we have Francis clearly showing the stigmata and clearly being viewed as the altar Christus. For across him on the other side uh, of, the, uh, of the nave and chancel uh, is the imago pietatis, the image of Christ as the man of sorrows, with the instruments of the passion surrounding him. So this sort of um, contrast between, or link between the two. Another sculpture also from Kilconnell depicts Francis with an unidentified bishop, possibly St. Patrick, or a depiction of the bishop of the local diocese. The friaries benefited greatly from the patronage of citizens of the towns and from the noble families of their localities and regions. And this patronage is evident in the elaborate tombs, such as this flamboyant uh, canopied altar tomb, again from Kilconnell in County Galway. Now, this tomb has a particularly fine example of the panoply of medieval saints who warranted a devotion at the time. All of them international, mind, by the way, uh, no Irish. Uh, St. John the Evangelist among them, uh, St. Louis of Toulouse, who for some reason the Irish took to as part of their Franciscan tradition, St. Catherine of Alexandria, John the Baptist, St. James of Compostela, there was a huge uh, connection between Ireland and Compostela in the Middle Ages, and for some unknown reason, St. Denis or Denis of uh, Paris. But what about St. Clare and devotion to her in late medieval Ireland? Well, her devotion and her cult in Ireland seem to have been influenced by the progress of the Franciscans in Ireland and how they, they advanced and what their culture was. For example, they were not deeply involved in the disputes of the continental friars of the 13th and 14th centuries. And it looks as if her de devotion to St. Clair grew with the introduction of the observant friars uh, in the 15th century. We find very fleeting references to her before the 17th century. A medieval friar of the strict observant movement uh, who writes in vernacular Irish poetry says that she surpasses all religious women. Thus, interestingly, by saying that, in a sense, she replaces Bridget as the head of the religious women, not alone in Ireland, but in this uh, poet's view uh, throughout the world, or certainly throughout his world. Her image does appear on one tomb, a 17th century tomb, 
uh, from, from Galway City, where with St. Saint Anthony, Saint Anthony uh, Francis and Dominic, she's there holding her monstrance. And she appears similarly on another Franciscan chalice uh, dated to 1639. An altar was dedicated to her in the side chapel in the Friary of Waterford City, and the tombs of the leading citizens of the city were erected in it during the 16th century. This is an important reference as it suggests that similar dedications were in other friaries, but either the textual or architectural evidence has been lost. But the greatest impetus for the appearance of a more widespread devotion to Clare came with the arrival of poor Clare's in Ireland in 1629. A group of noble Irish women joined an English community of nuns in the Spanish Netherlands and moved to, Dub to Dublin. The first century of the order in Ireland was a turbulent one, as due to unrest and official objections to them living as a community of Catholic nuns, they had to move their foundation a number of times, and in 1652 they were forced into exile in Spain. And I just give you an idea. This is where they ultimately ended up, uh, on Nuns Island, where they still are today, uh, in Galway City in the West. After Spain, a few returned to Ireland in the 1670s, and the community in Galway City survived the turmoil, mainly due by women living in small numbers in local houses around the city. Two remarkable texts uh, survive from this period. And this is one of our uh, great texts. Um, in the Irish tradition, as you may have gathered by now, we tended from the very earliest period of receiving Christianity and literacy in the sixth century to translate material into the vernacular uh, language, into Gaelic. And here we have uh, a manuscript, which is a vernacular translation into Irish of the rule of St. Clair. Uh, as you see, it is dated to 1636. Uh, it is in the particular script of insular script that we used really until the present, uh, until the 20th century anyway. And it is in the hand of the very famous friar, Michal O'Clary, after whom our institute is named, uh, who was a friar historian who in the 17th century collected an awful lot of material and saved it really and that was brought into uh, the Franciscan collection, and that is what we have uh, in our archive to this day. Now, mind you, this um, particular manuscript is kept in the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin. The Testament and Blessing of St. Clair were translated into Irish in 1647. Now, the other remarkable text that we have from this period is the memoir of Mother Mary Bonaventure Brown, written in Spain around 1670, where she had been exiled from Galway. She documented the arrival of the poor Clares in Ireland and their turbulent history during the 17th century, and also the sanctity of the nuns in the face of adversity. A note in the Galway convent's archives, which still survive to this day, leaves us with an impression of Mother Brown. The third abbess of the said convent, Mother Mary Bonaventure, alias Brown, was a very good, holy, and perfect religious sister and was endowed with many rare virtues as obedience, poverty, chastity, humility, and charity. She was prudent and wise, well-spoken in English, Irish, and Spanish. She was a mirror of, and looking glass of religious observance that belonged to her rule and statutes all her lifetime. And so in this remarkable woman, Bonaventure, Mary Bonaventure Brown, we find in 17th century Ireland an abbess in the image of Clare, dealing with adversity and following the ideals of her patron, ideals which had been associated a thousand years earlier with a native Irish female saint in St. Bridget. And what of the same St. Bridget in the 17th century? Well, I finish with a depiction of her from the earliest printed version of the lives of the three patrons of Ireland, Patrick, who you see in his Bishop's Mitre, uh, Columba, the great abbot, who is very much depicted as St. Benedict, and Bridget. Here we find a complete reinvention of Bridget, a shadowy figure from the early Middle Ages, now depicted as a counter-Reformation saint 
in the contemporary European tradition. So there's a complete change uh, to how she is uh, regarded and indeed how she's presented. To conclude, I have merely touched upon a subject that has so much potential and indeed has been part of the scholarly discourse for many centuries, the nature of female sanctity, and in particular how it was conceived in the medieval period. We must remember, of course, that in most cases the hagiography and textual legacies of female saints were transmitted by men. That was the world at the time. And this often influenced how these women's lives and achievements were portrayed, as in, for example, the relationship between Patrick and Bridget. But if we put aside themes of politics, of power and authority that are represented in their lives, we find that the core message concerns their forma vitae, the way of life, which was one of Claire's favorite phrases. Their forma vitae either concern their own radical poverty, as in Claire's case, or serving the poor, as in Bridget's case. Female saints were not always meek and mild, far from it, but often represented the forceful energy of women who were advocates of significant change in their society. Thank you. And in the tradition of Bridget and Claire, we present Dr. Brannock with some flowers from our own garden here on this holy hill and thank her for the wonderful, inspirational talk on female sanctity. Thank you, Dr. Brannock. And it is my great pleasure to present to Dr. Bretnach a certificate of acknowledgement and thanks for her Lunison lecture today. And the certificate reads, Newman University gratefully acknowledges Professor Idel Bretnach as the university's Dr. Dorothy A. Lunison presidential lecturer, March 14th, 2012, and bestows upon her this certificate in recognition of her scholarship and an appreciation for her lecture on Imitatio Christi, St. Clare and Medieval Holy Women, signed by both President Miranda and myself. Thank you so very, very much.